Hey, this is Dr. Priyanka Venugopal. Welcome back to the podcast, friends. I have so many little updates to share with you. And then we're getting into a wonderful conversation with my friend and master certified life coach, Brig Johnson. So a couple of updates. In just a few weeks, the pod is undergoing a little bit of an evolution. The Unstoppable Mom Brain has been the name of my business. It's been my mission. It's been, you know, my podcast and my Instagram and my website for as long as I can remember since 2020, since I basically started. And over the years, I have really been thinking a lot about how I can really share what my mission is for high achieving professional working moms. And that is how to burn stress, how to lose fat, not just water weight, not your muscle mass, but actually have fat loss and how to feel unstoppable in your experience, how to drop drama from the random off plan moments. And I decided that the unstoppable mom brain as a brand and as a business, while it's lovely, doesn't fully encompass what that mission really is. So in a few weeks, I'm going to be unveiling the brand new name of this podcast, and it is going to be it's going to be really fun. It's going to be super simple. And also knowing that my mission is still unstoppable. My mission is still for all of you listening, all of the working moms out in the world to still have a sense of feeling unstoppable amidst handling and navigating your real life challenges. So I wanted to share that with you. That is coming in just a few weeks. And I'm really excited over the next few weeks, I have a really fun podcast series coming up that I want you to stay tuned for. So let me just paint a little bit of a picture for what today's podcast episode is all about. My friend Brig and I were at a, an event together. This was back in April. And we were talking just about the work that we both do. Brig is also a coach who coaches on stress. And I also love to talk to my clients and coach my clients on how to burn stress at the root. And we were talking about one of the biggest obstacles that women face is this fear of missing out, FOMO, right? If you've heard of FOMO, fear of missing out, we're fear, we have fear of missing out on joy, on connection, on relaxation, on opportunities. And sometimes our fear of missing out drives us to take actions that we sometimes later regret. You know, for the purposes of weight loss, it might lead us to eat, snack, nibble, lick, bite foods, over drink when we're not actually hungry. But it can really translate in so many different scenarios. And Brig was sharing just in passing at the time, this concept that she loves to talk about and teach, which she calls JOMO, which is the joy of missing out. Now you better believe I love a good concept. I love talking about new ways of thinking about the things that we are missing out on. And I asked Brig if she would join me on a conversation on this podcast where we could really break down what is the fear of missing out really all about? and how might there actually be a little bit of joy that we can start to experience if we want to turn around some of the behaviors that we end up regretting. So I hope you all really love this podcast conversation with my friend Brig. And if you do, I want you to send me an email, info at the unstoppablemombrain.com and share with me, what is your one biggest takeaway from this episode? And how do you want it to start changing how you are losing weight, burning stress at the root, and feeling more unstoppable in your life. Without further ado, I welcome Brig Johnson to the podcast. Hey friends, welcome back to the podcast. Today I am joined by my good friend and master certified coach, Brig Johnson. She is a master coach. She talks all about stress and how we can really arm ourselves with a lot of mindset skills and strategies to overcome some of the stresses that we're having to live bigger and better lives. I'm going to have Brig introduce herself and we're going to get into something that she told me a few months ago. It just caught my attention. I've been hounding her for the last few months. We have to talk about this on the podcast and I'm so glad that you're here, Brig. Welcome. I can't wait to talk to you about Jomo today, but let's get into it. Tell us about you. Oh, good. I'm excited to be here too. And thank you for the invite. I always love talking with you. I just think our conversations always go on and on and they always leave me enlightened and thinking clearer and deeper. So I love it. So I'm Brig Johnson and I am a life and master coach for high achieving black women. And I help them reduce their stress in life in their relationships and in their health. So that's me. How did you, you know, cause I know we're going to be talking about 
FOMO and JOMO. Don't worry if you don't know those terms, we're going to define them. But before we get into that topic, because I think it's such a big one for high achieving women, we feel like we're going to be missing out on something. Mm -hmm. We spent so much of our life in education, in working, in studying that we have missed out on a lot of fun, maybe in our youth, maybe we're trying to make up for it now. How did you get to stress as one of the things that you know high achieving women really need to address? And then we'll get into FOMO and JOMO. So good because, you know, as a black woman myself, like going against and going up against big things that I wanted to do, even when I started, because I'm a nurse anesthetist by practice and trade. And I remember going into like the um, interview and knowing that there were only a hundred slots for like, and they let it be known that they were like, if we have 1500 applicants and I'm like, oh, right. So it's like, stress and then our my reaction to stress but what i started noticing as i got older was some of the stress was wasn't related to what i was doing but to what i was thinking and i'm like but i didn't want to demonize my thoughts like i didn't want to like oh i shouldn't be thinking that because i'm like no like it would make sense that I'm thinking about some of the things because you know how we take thought work and coaching and everything. And then we just use that as another tool to beat ourselves up against the head and say, I'm doing this wrong too. And I started noticing that and I was like, oh, so what if I normalize it? And then what would that be? And then it started being, oh, my body, my brain is just stressed about this thing. It's stressed about what people are going to say. It's stressed about this. And most of the things, procrastination, perfectionism, self-doubt, all of those are stress responses. And if we looked at it that way, instead of demonizing ourselves, what would happen? And so that's when I came up with not stress management, because stress management is like ticking off the box and making it balanced. But stress mastery, which is understanding why I'm stressed at this. Normally, it's a safety issue of some kind, bringing in our conditioning as a marginalized people or as women or gender or whatever. And also like using stress for us, because just like in working out, like we intentionally stress our bodies out. So I'm not one of those that's like an advocate of a soft life or Mm -hmm. no stress or stress free. I'm like, no, we would be weak as can I cuss Mm -hmm. on here? (laughs) I mean, maybe we'll, I don't know. I guess we're going to work. I doubt we will cut. Mm -hmm. We will Mm -hmm. be very weak. And I'll Mm -hmm. just let you get that out. Mm -hmm. But we would be very weak if, yeah, There were no stressors. There was no adaptation. The thing that makes us amazing as women, as marginalized identities, is our ability to adapt. The thing that gets us is when we lack that ability. And when we don't know how to de-stress our life, when we have insults or recover, then we lack that ability to adapt. And that's where I think the difference is on us creating the lives that we want is understanding life is going to happen and we're going to have a response to it. How do I recover from it? How do I perceive it? How do I experience it? What do I make it mean about me? I, you know, I was, I forget when this was, I I was talking to one of my clients who, and again, my clients are these high achieving professional working moms. And I often tell them you've signed up for the life of a high achiever. You've Mm -hmm. signed up for the life of a professional working mom, which means inadvertently you've signed up to experience some stress. And I say that because you've signed up, you love growth. Mm -hmm. Mike, you know, I think that anyone that's listening to this podcast loves growth. You love accomplishment. You love hitting that A plus, the gold star. And if it was easy to do and if everyone could do it, it makes sense you might not have stress. Mm -hmm. So actually anyone listening to this podcast, we don't actually want a stress-free life. What we actually want is our ability to manage the stress that we're experiencing, not feel out of control with it, not feel like it's running the show. But maybe if we change our relationship with stress, we can live bigger lives and maybe make bigger leaps forward. Yeah. I remember we were, I saw you on stage. There, There have been so many instances where I've seen Brig speaking on some stage or another. And 
every time that you have shared a concept, I'm like, Brig, we need to talk about this on the podcast. We have to talk about this. And this is a conversation, I think you and I were talking in April, we were at an event together and we both, I think maybe it was our experience with Bev. Bev was on the podcast last week. She is one of our deep dive coaching instructors. Me and Brig did deep dive coaching. And mm -hmm. I think that that was probably where I started to get to know you outside of just this amazing speaker on stage and this amazing coach in the community. I was like, wow, me and Brig really have a lot of similarities as it comes to how we want to engage with stress. And you said something in April when we met, we were talking about the fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. And you said something about, you like turned it on its head and you said, oh no, it's not the fear of missing out. It's the joy of missing out. Mm -hmm. But tell us a little bit before we get into the joy of missing out, mm -hmm. what has been your experience with FOMO, the fear of missing out? Why do you think that this is a thing? And how did you get to turning it over on its head? When we think of fear, I always go to like, if you're thinking of fear, think of safety. There is something in there biological in our DNA that is telling us we're missing out on something and it's a big fear. So if it's a big fear, then there either it's, it's pulling on the, on those tugs of, I don't belong. Maybe I don't belong as much as I did. Like if your friends don't invite you somewhere, maybe I don't, maybe that community isn't as strong for me as I thought. Maybe they don't like me as much as I thought, which is a safety issue of belonging in a group. Right. And so understanding that, right. Or our FOMO of, I didn't get invited to the big party at the job. And that's where the promotions are going to happen from that relationship. So then there's that fear of, I may not be able to provide for my family or I may miss an opportunity. Our, our ability to contribute in the way that we want to is huge for us. And it is a it is a, a primal need for us to be able to contribute, right? So belonging, contribute, relationship is the same thing. Like he didn't ask me out on a date, like mm -hmm. our ability to feel love, that intimacy, that is a safety issue too. So mm -hmm. the joy of missing out is understanding those fears and then like, and understanding what's driving those and then allowing ourselves to go, oh no, baby, there's, if they don't want you, there's someone else, or if this mm -hmm. is happening and it's okay, like, but to make it, to bring down the fear so much so that we can actually have a rational relationship in our brain about what we're actually missing out on. Cause most of the time what we're actually missing out on, we really don't want to go to the happy hour with the other people while they getting drunk and talking. I don't, I really don't like, <laughs> and I really did want to be in my bed at nine o'clock instead of being right. out with the girlfriends. I was tired. So yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. One of my clients was sharing with me this past week. She was saying that she would often find herself snacking and overeating at night because she had this fear of missing out. And she was like, she couldn't pinpoint what was the feeling, right? Like we talk a lot about like, how do you feel an emotion and and mm -hmm. not numb that feeling with, with food. Mm -hmm. But the reason she was having a hard time is because when I asked her, fear of missing out on what? Mm -hmm. And she couldn't really pinpoint what it was. So what's interesting is sometimes FOMO, it's this really vague term. We don't even know what it is that we're afraid of missing out on. Right. And I'm curious what you think about this, but in my experience is it's, we're afraid of missing out on a feeling. I'm mm -hmm. afraid of missing out on feeling satisfied, on feeling mm -hmm. proud of myself, on feeling accomplished, on feeling mm -hmm. some joy, right? Some some play, some relaxation. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm afraid of missing out on a feeling. So it's not ever the food or the mm -hmm. actual going out that we're mm -hmm. actually afraid of missing out on. It's the feeling that we're afraid of missing out on. Yeah. I think on food, I I, I used to do it very practical. Be like, oh, like if you bought something and it's like, and you're actually a fool, but there's half of it. And you're like, mm -hmm. okay, but it's not going to be as good tomorrow as it is today. So, you know, I need to enjoy it now because it's just not going to be good. That's the fear of missing out because like yeah. when I do it tomorrow, it's not going to be the same. And mm -hmm. my answer would always be, well, just go to the store and buy it again tomorrow. Like, is it actually a miss? Like, mm -hmm. if there was a cake that I made and it took me forever to make it and such and such, it's like, okay then I would just give myself permission to do in the work to make it again next week. It's like, especially if it's something that I don't normally, like I make a, a mean lasagna. Well, it takes me a long time to make that lasagna. So therefore I may make it 
only three times a year or one time a year. But on that, I'm like, I just give myself permission. It's like, you know what? If you want it again, I promise you, I will make it again. Like I answer yeah. that for myself. Like, right. so that it's like, we can have it again. It doesn't have yeah. to be once a year. Like, <laughs> Right. It's actually what you're speaking to actually kind of like what's coming up for me is this idea that I think this is especially true with high achieving women who have that all or nothing right. um, tendency, which is yeah. like, if I don't get it now, then I'm never going to get it. And so it makes a lot of sense that it triggers that scarcity or that fear that we're not going to get this again. And I would say, and I just say this because I remember like when I was on the diet roller coaster, we have this very like indulgent, restrictive cycle. So yes. because we've told ourselves, I'm never allowed to have enter the name of the food or the alcohol right. or whatever it is ever again, mm -hmm. let me get it while I can. So we have this mm -hmm. like squirreling motion of like, let me eat it while I can, get it while I can, because I might mm -hmm. not allow myself to have it again later. And kind of what you're saying in terms of speaking to that is like, what if we just made ourselves a promise that I, I can have it again next time? Yeah. It's like just yeah. not a problem. Yeah. It's like understanding the, uh, again, it's like understanding the reason for the, uh, is it a safety issue? Is this all or none? Like, what's the thing? And just slowing down enough to understand what are we doing here? Like, yeah. do we think our friends are never going to love us and we're going to be alone and we can't, we don't have the capacity to make another set of friends, even if those friends go away? Is this a safety mm -hmm. issue? Or is this a, uh, I like, it's not going to be as good tomorrow, whatever. Like we can go to the store and buy it. Like it's 45 minutes away. I got to eat it now. Like even on vacation, you know, it's like, this is the one restaurant and I'm never going to be here again. I'm like, okay. Like, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Those kind of things. What is it? And I think when we mindfully understand what's driving it, my approach is always, I don't need fixing. I need understanding. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I'm not trying to fix any of it. I'm just want to understand. So therefore I can take care of me because it's me that's going to take care of me. So I'm going to answer the safety issue. I'm going to answer the, Hey, does the restaurant that like, babe, can we come here again next year? Like mm -hmm. what, what is it? Right. Like, what is it that my soul is needing? How can mm -hmm. I understand myself and give myself what I need that protects my well being? Right. Because right. that's basically the joy of missing out is I'm not missing. I'm actually providing for my well-being. I just need to understand what it is that I need. Right. Oh, yeah. OK. So I feel like I'm understanding this better. So the way that you're describing the joy of missing out, when you can get to the root cause of the thing you're mm -hmm. actually worried about missing mm -hmm. and you can actually answer and yes. understand, oh, it's just this feeling right. that I want to have. It's just the safety that I want to have. It's this connection that I want to experience. Right. That's the real mm -hmm. thing I want. And we can understand it and recognize it. Mm -hmm. There's a joy in understanding that experience because the food is ne was never actually doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you, okay, I want to kind of go into a practical example. So I want you to imagine you're out like girls night. Right. Mm -hmm. Friday night girls night. This is like such a common example. I see this coming up all the time. This has come up for me too. Mm -hmm. Go out to girls night. Everyone's grabbing, you know, we're getting a glass of wine or a round of margaritas. There's some chips and dip happening. Mm -hmm. And you have decided you're going to enjoy your one glass of wine or your one margarita. And now everyone's going for their second round. Right. Getting another pitcher of margaritas. And so you have this feeling in your mind, this thought, which is like, oh, I don't want to miss out. Mm -hmm. Number one, I don't want to miss out on this fun experience. There's yeah. clearly like a collaborative feeling happening. Like there's mm -hmm. jokes and laughter happening yeah. over alcohol or food. Right. So number one, I don't want to miss out on that. Number two, I don't want to be the only one that's mm -hmm. not having a second drink or partaking in the food. Mm -hmm. Number three, I feel like I'm going to not have as much fun. Mm -hmm. So if I'm sitting here sipping on my water mm -hmm. <laughs> and everyone else is having the chips and having the margaritas, I I'm going to miss out on fun. Mm. How can we like take these these three? I think these are really common. Right. Very, very real fears of missing out on fun and connection and turn right. that into there's a joy in missing out. Like I, I hear somebody be like, there's no way, there's no joy. Yeah. In and I and and all I see is joy in that. But mm. here's the deal: because there's the joy of understanding that connection was the most important thing. 
Mm -hmm. right? There's a joy in understanding, like, and once you do it, because if you've ever done this before and you've done it and you've got done it enough where it's not awkward anymore, because I've even gone to friends and not like gone out to eat with friends and not ate because I already, I've already eaten. And the first time you do it, it's awkward and your brain is messing with you and like, oh, you should just, and your friends are going, what are you doing? But right. they get used yeah. to it too. Like right. you become this person and we think that's that time lapse is stamped forever. You show up the next time your friends are going to eventually leave you alone. It's like, she's not eating. Right. They know it because that's who you are. If that's like, no, I already ate. I'm good. They will, they will stop eventually, but we never go through to the other side of that. Mm -hmm. And when you get there, then you understand, oh, it was about the connection. When you experience them, without the alcohol or whatever. It's like, oh, I didn't need alcohol. And there wasn't any missing out because you did have the one margarita. It's like, you're, you're, right. you know, the brain is right. like, we don't have anything. Oh, yeah. really? So that one margarita wasn't enough? Like, right. 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 It's like yeah. that ability to have authority over your brain, like, and like instruct it. Right. Is I, yeah. so joyful. And then the second thing, the last thing I want to say, on the joy of missing out is the joy also comes the next day when we get to celebrate ourselves intentionally, when we don't feel like we would, if we had had two drinks, when we get on and like see the consequence of it, there is a joy of that too. But because we don't celebrate those small little things, it doesn't get to be joyful. Right. I love that you're actually sharing that because this is actually one of those things where, you know, when you hit a goal, this is like high achievers across the board, they'll even lose the pound and they don't recognize it at all. They just move on to the next thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think kind of what you're describing is just catching like in that social setting, right? You have mm -hmm. your one drink, you have your glass of wine or your margarita, and then you actually give yourself that experience of stopping and mm -hmm. recognizing, I just want to have connection here. You experience joy on the other side of it. I think what you're saying is we just never get to the other side. We never, so get we to never the even experienced it. Right. Or when we get to the other side, we don't, we don't give it language. Mm -hmm. We don't tell ourselves what we just did. Right. We don't direct our brain to say, Hey, this is what happened. This is what, this is what we experienced. Wasn't that amazing? We don't give that narrative. We right. listen to our brain. I was like, if we talk to our brain more than we listen to it and direct it. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I think one of the other things I was just thinking about is when we and this has been my own experience because I've always kind of self-identified as an awkward introvert, at, at least before, you know, in my younger years, especially mm -hmm. it's, it's changed as I've gotten older, but still to this day, I'm like, I'm so awkward. I'm an introvert when I meet people for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I used to feel like, you know, if I just had something in my hands, I'm talking about social gatherings. If I had mm -hmm. like a plate of food or if I had a drink in my hand, I somehow I felt less awkward because I had something to do with my body, with my hands. Yeah. Yeah. And that led to overeating, over drinking. And I realized, kind of speaking to your point, I had just wanted to feel belonging and connection yes. and have conversation. Yes. But actually, the food and the alcohol was preventing me from actually talking and mm -hmm. actually being curious and getting to know people and actually forget getting to know people. People couldn't get to know me mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of that experience, which I just think is so fascinating to understand that. And I, and I, you tell me what this is true, but to get there, there's discomfort. There's yes. an uncomfortable space. Friends, yes. like if you're listening to this, this is not just like, you know, I mean, I think no. being aware of it is important, but also acknowledging that there is discomfort with that. Yeah, totally. And signing up for it. Yeah. Like, it's like, yeah, I, there's a discomfort with this and I'm signing up for it. Just like you would if you went to the gym, there is a discomfort to lifting heavier weights, nor do you go to the bar. I'm going to deadlift tomorrow, probably, nor will I start my deadlift with 150 pounds. I'm going right. to just lift the bar with nothing on it, warm up with that. Right. And then I'm going to put on an a 10 pound, I'm going to lift with that. Like, okay, doing okay. And then I'm going to go up the same thing for us with these things, but we expect ourselves to just go in and not feel awkward. And that's not true. Yeah. But you do become the person 
where 145, 150 is your warm up, right? right? Like if you keep doing it, yeah. our brain doesn't change. If that's the way it happens in going to the gym, I, we don't have a, a separate brain for doing this type of work. It's the same brain. We don't right. have a separate nervous system that like conforms to working out in a gym and building muscle to building new identities. It's the same nervous system, meaning it's the same practice. Right. I do love that. Repetition, yes. right? We yeah. do it on reps. We do repetition and then we slowly work our way up. It's the same system. Mm -hmm. It's not a different, like we don't go get a new brain and nervous system when we want to do big, like it's the mm -hmm. same system. Yeah. I think one of the biggest, you know, obstacles for high achieving women is that we think if I don't get it right away mm -hmm. and, and by right, and right away, you know, this is like kind of vague, right? We can each kind of think about the goal that we have, but if I don't, you know, lose the weight right away, if I don't deadlift within X number of weeks, if I don't get the promotion, if I don't get the job, if I don't get this, you know, massive achievement in a, a really short amount of time, then I must not be capable. I must not be able to do this. I must, I'll probably never get there. I'll fail at this. It's like such a strong negative bias for especially high achieving women. And then I think what ends up happening is we never put the reps in. It's yeah. like we have the most convenient story to not put in our full effort mm -hmm. and putting in the reps to get there. Yeah. And my answer to that is you're right. But I want us to understand why that is there, why that narrative is there, which is like, oh, I have to get it right. And maybe I'm not supposed to do it and everything. That is our conditioning. And until we understand that and understand that that was taught to us, that's actually not correct. The person who takes five hours to learn two plus two equals four, or the person who learns two plus two equals four in 30 minutes, two years later, you cannot tell the difference. Right. They said two plus two is always going to equal four. Once they learn it, they learn it. There's no distinction. Like you cannot go in a kindergarten room and go, oh, that was the kid that walked at seven months. And here's the kid that walked at 13 months. You right. can't tell the difference. But yet somewhere the perfection of I've got to get it right. And I got to get it right the first time has been conditioned to us because it was never allowed for us to have mistakes. Mm -hmm. It was never allowed for us to not have all the answers. If we spoke up, we better have all of the answers, especially if you're a woman mm -hmm. in this world. Like if you spoke up in medical school in the mm -hmm. 1960s, you had to know all, cause they were gonna grill you, right? So it's like, it wasn't even allowed for us to make mistakes. So therefore now we've taken that and on ourselves. And all we have to do is see that. And so I will usually ask myself, oh, so you're not allowed to make mistakes? Oh, you have to get it right 100% the first time? What our conditioning has done is it's dehumanized us and we get to offer our humaneness back, which means mm -hmm. humans make mistakes. Humans figure it out. That is the way I get to my bigger thing is I do something, I get data and feedback. I figure out that didn't work. I gained weight, didn't lose weight. I don't make it mean anything. I use that data to do something different. And that's how we get to our goal. Yeah. But we've been told it's this beautiful, straight, upwardly projected line that yeah. always rises up. And that is our problem. Not, it's not human life. at all. Yeah. Our yeah. life isn't the problem. We make our life the problem. Our problem is the line. Right. I that's know I think it's wrong. also kind of interesting. And just to validate anyone that's listening to this, that, that's experienced this feeling of like, I'm not, and we talk about this on the podcast all the time. So if you're a listener, you've heard me say this before, but if that's ever been you, because it's still me to this day, right? I still right. notice that desire to get it right quickly, to get it yes. right the first time. This is normal human. I think your brain is designed to want to win. Mm -hmm. However, it's also, I think, just so validating to know that it was rewarded for you at some point along yes. your journey. So I know for me, when I was a kid, if I got the right answer, yeah. I got a smile from a parent. I got, you know, a good job from a teacher and that created a feeling of safety, belonging, love, like Priyanka, yeah. you're getting it right. So it yeah. makes sense that we have developed these rules that we've taken mm -hmm. the conditioning so deeply yeah. and it can feel but disconcerting to let it go. 
But we also have to understand, like, it wasn't even, it's the conditioning, but it's also combined with when we add in like Puritan beliefs with it too, like, mm -hmm. like God, like God punishes those who don't do it. So if the doors open, if the Red Sea's part, it must be that this is the way I'm supposed to go. Yeah. And if it doesn't, then maybe I'm going outside of God, universe, whatever your religion is. But usually there is a religious part of it too. Like good equals easy, right? And if it's not easy, then it must be, I'm not, this is not the plan for me. So it's totally out of our hands, right? And it's like, oh, we just have to understand that messaging and decide whether or not we agree with that messaging or not. You know, and I think that even kind of just bringing this back to this idea of JOMO and right. the joy of even catching and acknowledging these, yes. the, these, this conditioning, I think that, and you tell me, Brig, this has been my experience with my clients. I think that there's such a feeling of freedom mm -hmm. and liberation in our minds when we start to realize, oh, that's not a truth that that, that right. conditioning is not it, it's it's a rule that I somehow adopted many years ago without realizing it and wait a second I can actually choose to unsubscribe from yes. that conditioning and I think that that's kind of the beauty of coaching yeah. coaching and really the mindset piece of showing our clients these rules that they've adopted the conditioning that we've adopted that's actually creating a very very small experience and yeah. like living with a lot of the scarcity and fear yeah. I also want to bring up another point, if I may, about yeah. JOMO. Mm -hmm. And that's the understanding that every time we say yes to something, that means we have to say no to something else. Right? So we may say yes to, yes, I want the margarita. Then we're saying no to whatever. Like if we're not staying on our plan, we're saying no to the goal. Mm -hmm. But it's like, if we say yes to this opportunity, do you want to take this position? Yes. Then when the next position comes, we have to say no to that, right? So there is joy of saying no. It's like, is it a hell yes? If it's not, it's a no, right? And so that's the joy of missing out too, because I get to say yes to the things I really want to say yes to by saying no and honoring my FOMO. Like, no, yeah. it's a no. And maybe right? that, that's also what touches on what might be hard for some women who have a hard time saying no to mm -hmm. responsibility, to taking yeah. on more tasks, to yeah. doing more. I think that this is, again, such a high achiever women's issue where we want to right. say yes to so many things. So maybe that's also part of why it feels hard is yeah. we're just used to saying yes, we have a hard time saying no. Yeah, because if we say no, then maybe we're selfish or we got to manage other people's feelings for us and everything. But understanding our conditioning of our value for us as women for so many times has been what other people think of us, not what we think or what we can do for them or how we make other people feel and think. And when we really understand that's how our value, whether we are considered good mom, like think of all the things, and I know you probably talk about this all the time on a podcast, but like what a good mom would do, right? It's yeah. it's other people, what other people think and feel about us, right? Yeah. And sometimes what a good, like I get to decide what a good mom is. And for me, I had to, I had to dismantle the trope of the good black woman for me and in a lot of my clients too, or the good whatever, because it's like, oh, she gets up and she does this and like she's toils and she's like, she just works and she puts him first and she denies everything and she takes a second job to put her kids through school and like, where's her dream? Where's her mm -hmm. thing? And so there is, we just have to understand the conditioning of caretaking and how much caretaking has been woven, woven into the fabric of what makes women such a thing called good. Mm -hmm. And we get to decide if I even want to take that on. Yeah. 
there's these two very really overlapping concepts. One is what you're talking about right now, the, the conditioning that women have gotten, how we've been raised to mm -hmm. achieve more, do more work, mm -hmm. say yes to everything. And then there's this other piece that we're talking about, which is like the fear of missing out on joy and connection and pleasure and belonging. And I think a big overlap ends up being because we have gone so far down the road of this conditioning, we have missed out. Yes. Can we just acknowledge, like, I think that so many professional working moms yes. have missed out on rest, belonging, yes. connection, pleasure, yes. joy. We have missed out. So the mm -hmm. fear of missing out is a real thing. And I think kind of what we're talking about is like, what if we could acknowledge what got us here? What was mm -hmm. the conditioning that led us to missing out on some of these really core values that I think we want for ourselves? And how can we start to answer the truth of that? And listen, if we do this work, we get to pass this on. This is like yes. generational work. I always say like moms are the gateway to their families. Yes. This gets to be one of the things. If you want to pass this on to your children, we, we have to go first. Yeah. So good. Yeah. I love totally that. agree with that. I totally agree with that. And I think that comes from us step into, into like our, like we narrate, like, okay, I acknowledge, I listen to those parts of me that's like, I really like, yes, we have, and I'm going to do better. It's, it's listening and answering. I think we do a lot. We do really good at, in self-development of listening to, because a lot of people say, listen to that part, you know, like whatever, mm -hmm. but where's the answer? And this is the answer. This is what I'm going to do. This is right. how I'm going to meet this need. I'm going to say, I'm going to have one margarita. No, I'm not going to say you can't drink anything, right. but we're still on this. So this is my answer. We're going to have one and we're going to enjoy it. And we're going to get a Topa Chica with a lime the rest of the day. And right. we're going to connect. But until we can narrate and take over and say, this is the plan. I've heard you. Now here's the plan. Yeah. That's I, the joy. This is so good. And actually this, I mean, I know we're like going into a whole different concept, but one other thing that I know that has come up so much for my clients, especially is urges and cravings, right? So you mm -hmm. eat on, you eat on plan, you know, we have a quote, first of all, we have a quote unquote plan, mm -hmm. you eat on the plan and then you notice urges and cravings to snack and nibble. Mm -hmm. And one of the concepts that I was teaching my clients recently was if you have not purposefully planned in rest, relaxation, joy, mm -hmm pleasure, mm -hmm. like truly, you're taxing your brains all the time. You're expecting yeah. yourself to yeah. critically think at work, to manage mm -hmm. your kids, to handle all kinds of life. You're taxing yourself mm -hmm. all the time. If you have been winging your mm -hmm. rest, relaxation, and pleasure, mm -hmm. your brain will steal it. Yeah. And it comes in the form of FOMO. That FOMO mm -hmm. is going to be so strong. Like I deserve a break. I deserve a break because you do deserve a break. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to tie that in because I find that it is such a compellingly strong feeling that mm -hmm. I'm missing out on pleasure. And the answer is you are, you probably yeah. have been. And how do you want to answer for that yes. in a way that's deep, like truly deeply satisfying? Right. That takes your well-being into an account. Yeah. And don't forget to celebrate it when you do do that. Mm -hmm. yes. Like so that it becomes who you are, right? So it's mindfully understanding. If you wanted to know like a three-step process, it would literally yes. be mindfully understanding. Is this all or nothing? Is this safety? Is this because I have denied myself? Or like, why is this FOMO coming up, mm -hmm. right? And then, then it would be like, how can I answer it with taking my well-being into account? Right. And then what is my answer to this? I hear you now. This is what we're going to do. Here's my plan. And then celebrate. Yeah. Like intentional celebrating. Like, look at us doing it. Like, I would literally be celebrating myself as I'm drinking a Topa Chica. See, look at this. This is, mm -hmm. I would be narrating it as if yeah. I was watching me in a video and there needed to right. be a narrator. It's like, oh, right. she ordered it. Look at her. She's ordered Look at her go. Look at yeah. her go. Oh, look at you. You chewing another sip. Like, see, this yeah. isn't bad. Like you, he, 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 ha, ha, ha. Yeah. See, this really isn't that bad. Like I would narrate it. This is, so, that's such a, and anyone that's listening to this, like it might feel a little silly in your mind to do this step, but really it's, it's how you start changing your inner monologue. So yeah. rather than thinking, I can't believe I'm not allowed to have a second margarita, or I can't mm -hmm. believe that I'm not allowing myself to eat more chips and have all the fun. You're like, oh, look at you go. Right? Look at you following through on what you said. You're, this is amazing. Like it just changes your inner monologue, which is yeah. huge. 
Yeah. It's a concept I call Morgan Freeman it. Because you know how we watch National Geographic and Morgan Freeman's voice is like in the deer. Is such a, like we watch stuff and like we're enthralled with it, right? Because right. it's like there's a narration of telling us what's going on. Right. And I think for a lot of women, even high achieving women, we're missing the narration and we're looking to others to narrate. Mm -hmm. We're looking to our success to narrate. We're looking to the scale to narrate. We're looking for, we're actually look to our kids to narrate whether or not we're, I'm like, you want a, you want a 16 year old telling you you're a good mother? No. Like, right. Right. Like they don't yeah. get to narrate at this time. Like when they're in their thirties, maybe. Right. right. But you or don't like the get scale. Tell, like the scale right? is telling you that you did a no. good job. No, the no. scale does not get to tell you that. Your child right. does not get to tell you that. Right. But that's, it, so that's the conditioning, right? Like, mm -hmm. like we have been taught, like other good girl, mm -hmm. pastors, teachers, mom, don't mom, father, friends, everybody gets to the media gets to tell us we did a good job or narrates. Yeah. No. Yeah. A big piece of this is we're just so used to external validation. So yeah. in but, changing the, yeah. doing the Morgan Freeman approach, it's like practicing the muscle of internal validation. Exactly. That's, it's everything. Morgan Freeman, that shit is what I Morgan was. Freeman, it. I love it, Brig. Oh, this is such a good conversation. I am so glad that we got to talk about JOMO and FOMO. Oh. And anyone, seriously, when you listen to the podcast and you feel like, oh, yeah, that's me. They're talking about me. I want you to know you're not alone. That's why we're mm -hmm. having this conversation. It is to really bring light to validate your experience and also to give you insight that it can change, that we're right. all, we have so much capacity to change. That's what we're here to talk about. And if you love this podcast episode, if you took something away from it, I would love for you to tag both me and Brig over on Instagram. Brig, share your Instagram handle it's so we can Johnson tag you. Brig. Johnson Brig, easy. <laughs> love it. And how can we all find you? How can we get to know more about you? Yeah, I'm Johnson Brig on IG, Brig Johnson on Facebook and LinkedIn. And I have a podcast that is going to be rebranded. So by the time this happens, it would have already happened. And it is called the Black Women's Stress Solutions Podcast. I love it. We're going to put Formally links to everything. Breakthrough. What was it? Tell us the former name, just in case. Formally Breakthrough with Brig. <laughs> Breakthrough with Brig. We're going to have all of her, Brig's information in the show notes page. And I hope you all love this concept. I just, it bit me like a bug in April when you were talking about Jomo. And I'm like, hey, I actually want some more Jomo in my own life. So this has been such a great conversation, Brig. Thank you so much. I do want to admit one thing. Yeah. I do want to admit one thing. I can't take credit for Jomo. I think I saw it as an IG something and I, and I felt the same way. I was like, oh yes, joy. I don't yeah. know who it was, but I just saw Jomo and I was like, yes. So it is I one did. of those things that landed. Yeah. I didn't come I love up. It. I come I up with, a, I came up with Morgan Freeman that shit. Though, you but did. I yes, you did. And everybody now gets to benefit from it. I oh. love it. Awesome. Okay. You guys, we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. I hope you all enjoyed this conversation with Master Certified Coach Brake Johnson. She is such a dear friend who I love having these conversations with. And I think one of my most favorite things to do whenever I'm having these podcast conversations with either my friends, my peers, my coaches, or my mentors is these are the real kinds of conversations that I am actually having with some of my coaching peers. And I think it is just so incredibly fun to share this perspective, different perspectives on the podcast. I know that all of you are listening because you feel this desire to feel a little bit better, to feel a little bit less stressed, less overwhelmed. You want to hit more goals in your life. And you know that you're not here for a stress-free life, but you also know that there are more tools and opportunities for you to turn it around. If you know that coaching is a part of your journey, if you know that you want to learn how to burn stress, to lose the weight you want, you want a process that is proven and that really drops drama from the journey once and for all, then I invite you to join me and work with me in the Unstoppable Group, which is my six-month intimate small group coaching program. If this is at all interesting to you, I want you to send me an email, info at theunstoppablemombrain.com, and I will reply. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and we'll set up a time to talk to see if this is a group for you. And if it is, we'll get you in. I hope you guys all have an amazing week and keep a lookout for some changes coming to the podcast. See you next time. Bye.